folks are so incredibly kind. I have experienced nothing since I stepped foot onto this campus on Friday but being welcomed, being cared for, such a generosity that I am just so grateful for. So much so that I'm scheduled to board a plane this afternoon and go back to Nashville and I just may miss that flight. <laughs> I've decided I would love to stay with you. You are a welcoming congregation and I'm grateful to be in your company today. I'm thrilled to step onto this stage right after we would spend time honoring and praying for educators and administrators. Yes. I am married to a teacher. My wife has been teaching elementary school for over 20 years. My daughter is currently in grad school to be an educator and in her first year of student teaching. So you will be hard pressed to find a person who's more thankful for the work that you do, who understands the holy, sacred, life-giving work that you do, educators. And so I love that this time would begin with honoring you and praying for you and, and even reflecting on the work you do as it sets the stage for the conversation we're going to share. Because I want to spend time this morning talking with you about what kids have to teach us. I love that we have spent so much of our morning thinking about the family, thinking about children, thinking about what I believe they have to teach us uniquely. And I want to camp out in that space for some time this morning. As was just shared, I'm a therapist. I've been practicing at this amazing place in Nashville, Tennessee called, called Daystar Counseling Ministries for the past 25 years. In fact, I want to put a photo of the place where I work up on the screen because I would love for you to get an opportunity to see the place where I work and get a glimpse of this amazing team of folks. Yeah, I want you to take a close look at this photo. I want to say this first. We work in a house rather than an office building, which was a very intentional decision because if any of you have gone to counseling yourselves or you've taken kids you love to counseling, you know that it can be a somewhat overwhelming experience. And so we do everything we can to try to help kids and families feel as safe and comfortable as possible when they come. You will also notice from the photo we just shared that some of my colleagues got their own picture. <laughs> and the rest of us are all crammed in the middle together. That too is very telling. So we have five therapy dogs on staff in our practice right now, which are hands down some of the kids' all-time favorites. Those of us who are humans on staff are very aware that we're low in the pecking order, and <laughs> we are all okay with that. I work with an amazing team of people who I learn from daily. And I have long said that if you get to go to work every day and you spend your day with kids and dogs, you have a really great job. And as I said a few minutes ago, I think there's a lot we can learn from kids. I think they are amazing teachers. I think it is just our job to lean into what we can learn from them. And I'm privileged that I've had the opportunity to sit with them for all these decades in my work and learn from them. In addition to the kids I work with, I have three of my own. I mentioned my firstborn a moment ago. My firstborn is a girl, and about a year into her life, we got pregnant for the second time, and we were incredibly grateful. We went midway through the pregnancy for an ultrasound, as you do, and we walked into that appointment and said to the technician, okay, we're really old school. We don't want to know what we're having. We didn't know my daughter was a girl until the day she was born. We want to be surprised. So make a note in our chart, but don't tell us. And she agreed to that. And I can still remember where I was standing in that room as she was scanning my wife's belly. And she looked up with this huge smile and said, I see two heads. <laughs> yes. And I remember thinking, why are you smiling if the baby has two heads? <laughs> That just did not sound right to me. <laughs> you all, we were genuinely that shocked. We have no history of multiples in our family. My wife had not gained extra weight. Her counts weren't different. None of the indicators that are there when you're carrying multiples were there for us. 
So here we are midway through the pregnancy, knowing from having friends that have multiples that they always come early. And I start thinking about the timeline and I said to the technician, okay, complete change of plans. We are so behind that we do need to know. <laughs> I said, I'm going to lay down in the bed next to my wife and then you tell us what we're having. <laughs> and she said, two boys. Yes, thank you for that response. We are still recovering from that news 21 years later. <laughs> so I have a daughter and twin sons who have been some of my greatest teachers. Some of my greatest teachers. And as I think on kids as great teachers, I want to spend a few minutes this morning reflecting on a familiar passage in Scripture where Jesus calls a child to him and what he has to teach us in that. So I want you to revisit this passage with me. This is from Matthew 18, verses 1 through 4, and I want you to look on this familiar passage with fresh eyes. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child whom he put among them and said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And I want to dissect this passage with you for a few minutes this morning. I want to lean into three parts of this passage that I believe there is something of great importance to consider and what kids have to teach us. And the first thing I want to look at you all is the beginning of this passage, which I will call be responsive. And I want to point out something that may feel obvious, but is so important to consider. We're told that he called a child whom he put among them. What that tells us, that piece of the narrative tells us that this child that he called came instinctively. And what I want to say to you grown-ups in the room is this. Somewhere around 11 or 12 years of age, we all, whether you remember this or not, we all developed self-consciousness. We became aware of ourselves and the world around us in a brand new way. And that self-consciousness often can stand in the way of our responsiveness. In fact, that may have happened to you even this morning as you walked into this space. You may have seen a friend or someone you care for in this congregation who you know is navigating a loss of some kind. And rather than naturally responding to them, you may have stopped and thought to yourself, oh, I don't know if I should say something. Maybe they're not thinking about it. Maybe me commenting on it would make them more sad. That self-consciousness creeps in and starts to get in the way of our responsiveness. And kids don't have that. They just naturally respond. I'm convinced, grown-ups in the room, if we were present, if we put ourselves in this narrative, I want you to imagine what your response would have been if Jesus had pointed to you and asked you to come forward. I don't know with certainty, but chances are good out of that self-consciousness, we might have thought, oh goodness, I hope I don't say the wrong thing. I hope he doesn't ask me a question I don't know the answer to. I hope I'm dressed appropriately. I hope I don't trip on the way up. A lot of different thoughts that would get in the way of our naturally responding where I am convinced that child came immediately, instinctively. Because that self-consciousness had not crept in. Because when it does, oftentimes fear slides in as well. And you all think on it. I think we should just laugh together. One of my favorite things about kids is before that self-consciousness creeps in and that fear steps in, kids feel this freedom to just say what they need to say and ask what they need to ask. I love their natural curiosity. Just last weekend, my wife had a co-worker she teaches with who came by our house and she had her young niece and nephew with her and her niece was five and a half and starting kindergarten and she was so excited to tell my wife and I all about having just met her teacher and how kindergarten was going to go and midway through this conversation she looked up at the two of us and she said you know I haven't seen your house I'm going to take a lap around the place and check it out <laughs> I loved that 
She didn't ask if that was okay. She needed to see the space. She was curious. Now, what she observed was that one of my sons, we were getting ready to take to college, and so our house was stacked full of his stuff all over the place. And she came back to us and reported in. She goes, you've got a nice place here, but it's kind of a mess. <laughs> and she was 100% correct. I think about another little boy who came to our office not long ago, and I was asking him some questions in his very first visit at Daystar, and midway through that conversation, he said, can I ask you a question? And I said, of course you can. And he said, when you go in the movie theater, do your glasses automatically turn 3D? <laughs> Y'all, it had never occurred to me until that moment don't my glasses look like the 3D glasses they hand out at the theater? <laughs> what a great question. He was convinced that I just walked in the movie theater and they flipped right like that. I didn't need the extra glasses. I love the honesty. I love the curiosity. I love that self-consciousness hasn't crept in in a way that just doesn't get in the way. And we could learn from that. We could lean into that and watch and observe that curiosity, that honesty, that responsiveness, grown-ups, in a way that I think would free us up. That as Jesus called this child, the child came instinctively. And I want you to lastly consider that I think when self-consciousness creeps in and then it gives way to some fear... I think fear gets in the way of us being all of who God designed us to be. In fact, I spent time with a parent yesterday talking about how I think fear makes us more reactive in this world and less responsive. And you all, when I think on the number of kids who've taught me something about that, I think about another young man. I met this young man when he was a junior in high school. He was a great student, a great athlete, just a great kid. And he was not just a great athlete. He was the kind of kid who was very likely on his way to play football in college at a place of his choice. And second game of his junior year of that season, he would experience an injury that not only took him out of that game, it took him out of the game of football altogether. He would end up with a doctor standing over him, telling him he was going to need a surgery that would require a long rehab and would mean he wouldn't play the game of football again. And you can imagine being a 16-year-old kid who's imagining your future and then the rug gets pulled out from underneath you. And so this amazing kid started to feel some real sadness that gave way to some despair, and that's what brought him to my office. I spent a good year and a half with this amazing young man and his parents, and this brave, resilient kid fought through that sadness, that despair, he graduated from high school. He didn't get to go to the school of his choice. He didn't get to play football. He was just grateful to get to go to college. And freshman year of his college experience, I got a call from his mom, and she said, David, he's going to be home on fall break. He'd love to come in and just check in with you. And I said, I'd love to see him. We scheduled a time. He came in, and in sitting down with this kid, you all, he was facing all the things grown-ups that every one of us remember facing when we left home for the first time. Think back on that season of your life and how overwhelming it feels to launch out in the world and all the new stuff. And we were talking through that and somewhere in that conversation, he began talking about this moment. And grown-ups, you may remember this moment. Some of you as parents have maybe recently lived this moment with your own kids. But it's this moment where he was sitting in his college dorm room his parents had moved him in, everything was settled, and it was obvious to everyone in the room that it was time for his mom and dad to leave, but no one wanted to admit to that. And his dad finally got up the courage. He looked at his mom and he said, his room's set up, his schedule is ready, we've done everything we need to do, and now it's time we hit the road. He said, I'm going to pull the car around back, you all say goodbye to each other, and then we should head home. He and his mom walked down, his dad pulled the car around, and he said, David, my dad got out of the car, and he was crying harder than I had ever seen him cry in my entire life, so much so that he could barely speak. 
he just kept looking at this boy he loved, and he just kept saying, I love you. I love you so much. That's all he could get out. And I said, how was your mom in that time? And he chuckled. He said, I remember she kept giving a lot of reminders. She kept saying things like, you stay on top of your meal plan. You're the only one who's in charge of putting more money back on your card. <laughs> remember that yogurt I put in your mini fridge is going to spoil. It's check the expiration date. Moms, all those great reminders that you give us. She hugged her son. She and the dad got in the car to leave. And right as they were about to pull out, the mom rolled down the window. She looked at this boy she loves. And she said, don't drink. It is so dangerous. <laughs> Those were her parting words to her college son. Now, you all, what I want to say to you is this. I just mentioned that I spent a lot of time with this young man, and I spent a lot of time with his parents, and I'm here to tell you they are wonderful people. They're intentional people. They're thoughtful people. And if the truth be told, if I think about myself as a parent, in my best moments of parenting, I look more like that dad did there. I'm parenting out of a place of love. And in a lot of moments, I look more like the mom did in that moment. I'm parenting out of fear. And I don't think our kids can ever get the best of who we are when we're parenting out of fear. I don't think anyone we are in relationship with can get the best of who we are. All of who God designed us to be when we are postured in fear. We become to that point more reactive. We become less responsive. That fear roadblocks us. And kids remind us to go back to that responsiveness. I think they also remind us to be open. And I want to look at one more part of this passage. Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And I want to focus in on that unless you change part. One of the other things that I love so much about kids is I think they remind us to be students. That story I just got through telling you a few minutes ago about the little girl who was so excited to tell me about her kindergarten year... Kids go into every new school year knowing there are new things to learn. They are postured in a way where they're just open and curious. They know, I haven't learned that math yet. I haven't learned that social studies or history yet. And we tend to lose that openness, that curiosity, that posture of being a student. And I think kids remind us to hold on to that. I have a dear friend who is in his late 60s. And every time I see this friend, I will ask him the same question. I'll say, Carter, how are you? And you know what he says to me every time? He says, David, I'm growing. And I love that response. And then he'll go further. Here's what Jesus is teaching me right now in this season of my life. And I need that reminder over and over because I rarely encounter that with grown-ups. I encounter it all the time with kids. They will teach me something new. If I had a quarter for every time a kid had walked into my office to show me a magic trick or a card trick or a new piece of art they created, and I love it. It happened yesterday at the book table. I had this delightful little boy who wanted to show me a piece of art that he'd made. And we lose that, grown-ups. We sadly lose that. And I want to think on some points in terms of being open and what happens when we forget to change? Because I think there's so much lost opportunity in that. And I want to even challenge you. I talked a little with the parents about this yesterday. I want to challenge you right now in this moment of your life, whatever age you may be, I want you to think about a place where you would say you need to grow. Where is an opportunity for growth in your life? Relationally, spiritually, emotionally. Where is their opportunity to grow? What are the resources? What are the relationships that allow you to grow in those ways? What's something new that you could learn? And we talked a little bit yesterday when I was with the parents about how many of you have taken the Myers-Briggs before, the MBTI? Okay, a lot of you have. A lot of businesses and organizations use that. A lot of colleges use it as well. I was trained in the Myers-Briggs early on. And if you're thinking, I think I've taken it, I can't remember. With the Myers-Briggs, we all get four letters. We're either an extrovert or an introvert or a feeler or a thinker. We just 
find out more about how God hardwired us as people. So I trained in this. I think it's a great tool. How many of you are familiar with a tool called the Enneagram? Raise your hands. Okay, lots of you. So we use that tool a lot in our practice at Daystar. We have for decades. And I like the Enneagram a little better primarily because I think it is a great tool that is so compatible with growing in your relationship with Christ. I think it's an amazing tool for that. I've also seen it be a game changer in marriages and parenting. I like it's a little easier. Rather than four letters, we get one number. So we are all a number between one and nine. And the many of you who raised your hands, I won't ask you to tell me your numbers. But I will simply tell you I'm a one on the Enneagram. Some of you chuckled because you know what that means. The name given to the one is the perfectionist or the reformer. The reformer means that we see everything that's wrong first and we want to make it right. Now you can imagine how tricky that might be in the context of marriage sometimes. <laughs> you all, when I'm at my very worst as a one, I can start to believe that I might be the fourth member of the Trinity. <laughs> or at the very least, God's Southeast representative. I have all these good ideas, I just need people to listen to them. That is not the least bit true. And when I would say I'm at my best as a one, I can bring a lot of leadership and vision. When I'm at my worst as a one, I could make the people that I love and care for the most in this world feel like they are up for a performance evaluation. I could just plow right over them. And so this, for me, has been a great tool of growth as a professional, as a person, as a husband, as a father. And when I think about my oneness over the course of my marriage and my parenting, I have this vivid memory of being in my kitchen. My kids were like four and six. It was a Saturday morning. The house smelled like pancakes and syrup. My wife was flipping pancakes at the stove. I had just gotten out of the shower, and my kids were still in their PJs. They had all this great bed head, and they're eating their pajamas. And I walk in the kitchen, and I say, okay, everybody, listen up. we got a busy day. I'm going to take the two of you to the soccer game. Mom's going to take you to the birthday party. We're going to meet back at the house. Your grandparents are going to be here, and I'm just rolling through this list, and my kids are just trying to eat their breakfast. And my sweet wife put the spatula down at the stove, and she walked over really close to me. She put her hand around the back of my neck, and she said, Sweetheart, you are the only person in this house who is interested in your agenda right now. <laughs> Isn't that great? It's one of the most loving things anyone has ever said to me. And what I would say to you is I think on this idea of being open is every one of us needs someone who loves us to at times get really close to us, put their hand around our neck or on our shoulder and tell us something we can't see. Speak some truth to us in love as an opportunity for growth. So as you think on that question of where do I need to grow, what's something new I could learn? If you feel stuck in that question, let me give you a little hint. You could ask your spouse. I bet they know a place you would benefit from growing. You could ask a trusted friend. I want you to think on what it would look like to posture yourself in a way that you would invite that kind of feedback. Who are some people who would speak that truth in love, that allow me to grow, that I could become a student because kids remind us of that in a beautiful, extraordinary way. And the last thing I want to reflect on is be humble. And I want you to look back at this part of the scripture. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And I think out of that responsiveness, out of that openness, I would argue I think kids are just instinctively often in that posture of humility that we could learn from. And you all, I would even go a step further and say, I think more than any other time in the world, we need humility. Humility and civility. In fact, one of the saddest things for me is how few examples I think kids get to see on the grown-ups around them of what it looks like to live in humility and civility. Civility meaning that I can disagree with respect. Civility meaning that I could listen as much as I'm talking. 
And y'all, when I think on humility and stability, I think it's really important that we reflect for a minute on what humility is. Because I think sometimes we will misinterpret what it means. I think humility means understanding my value as it relates to other people's value. I don't think it's just about becoming more self-deprecating. I think it allows me to build others up. In fact, I want you to jot down these scriptures and sometime later today, I want you to reflect on them. There is so much wisdom here. I love that Proverbs remind us, reminds us that the wise measure their words. James reminds us, James 1, be slow to speak, quick to listen. And I don't believe we are living in a time in history where people are slow to speak. In fact, let's be honest. Right now, as we sit here, someone is typing in all caps somewhere in the world in the comment section of something. Lots of exclamation points. Speaking loudly, declaring loudly. And you all, I love, speaking of children, I love children's books. I'm a great lover of children's literature. And I think about Madeline Lingle, the great children's author, who once said, we draw people to Christ not by loudly declaring how wrong they are and how right we are, but by showing them a light that is so lovely they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. There's our calling as people of God to show this broken, hurting world a light that is so lovely they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. And I don't believe we can do that when we are shouting loudly how wrong they are and how right we are. And I think kids remind us of the importance of that because you all, I think humility is a place of strength, not of weakness. I want you to reflect on the words of scripture that remind us that our Jesus, this Jesus we have been singing about today, we are told in Philippians, he became obedient. He humbled himself and became obedient even unto death on a cross. Do you hear the strength in that? The strength in his humility? There's our roadmap. There's our model. The other thing that I think humility does is it postures us to see our need. And that's probably the other thing I love so much about kids is their awareness. Back to even them being students. They know they have new things to learn. They know they don't have it all figured out. They have an understanding of their need differently that I think we can lose. And when I think of all the kids who've taught me something about that, I think about another kid. I'm going to call this little guy Jack. And Jack is actually one of my twins' really good friends. I've known Jack since he was a first grader. Jack spent a lot of time in our house. Jack's played on basketball teams with my boys and soccer teams. And Jack is one of those kids who you never have to wonder what he's thinking. You know you're going to find that out at some point along the way. And it is quite a discovery always. I love it. And so it is a fun adventure when Jack is spending time in our home. And even within our group of parents of this little group of kids who's traveled together through school, we all kind of swap Jack stories. And our friends, the Connors, had Jack over for dinner one night when he was in elementary school. And they were going to share a meal together. And Mr. Connor said, Jack, because you're our guest, we'd love to offer, would you like to say the blessing tonight? And he said, I'd love to, Mr. C. So they all bowed their heads and held hands and there was silence and then there was more silence and then more silence and Mr. Connor thought you know what I should have just cued him that he could start whenever he's ready so he lifted his head and he said Jack whenever you feel ready you go right ahead bowed his head again there was silence <laughs> there was more silence and then Mr. Connor thought you know what he might feel overwhelmed at this table with all these people so I should let him off the hook I'm gonna open my eyes and just tell him he doesn't have to do it if he doesn't want to and right as he lifted his head Jack opened his eyes and he said I got nothing
Can you imagine having that kind of freedom? You all, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that challenging? You may have entered this room today in that exact place, feeling like, I've got nothing. And someone may have said, how are you? And you said, I'm great, the way we often do when we're not. That freedom that we lose, that kids remind us to have the humility of just saying, you know what, I'm empty. We've been looking at this passage in Matthew 18, a little bit earlier in Matthew 11. You all know this passage. We are invited to come to Jesus when we're empty, when we're heavy hearted, and he will give us rest. We are invited to come to him with nothing. And he has everything. In fact, I love that we just made that declaration a little bit earlier in worship. We need that reminder. In fact, if I were at home in Nashville right now in my home church, as we are preparing to receive the benediction, our pastor would invite us to stand, and then he says, palms up. And we all stand in this way, and we do this for two reasons. We do this as a reminder that the benediction is a blessing. It's a blessing that we need. And we do this as that reminder of exactly what we just declared. We have nothing. And he has everything. And you all, I've been so deeply affected by this posture on Sunday that I've been praying in this posture Monday through Saturday in my home. In my quiet time with the Lord. I've just been praying with my hands open. As a father, this is been a reminder to me that my children belong to him and not to me. My marriage belongs to him and not to me. My work belongs to him. There is something about this posture that has been so deeply impacting to me that I've been praying in this way over and over. And I want to offer you that reminder today. I was with a mom not long ago, and she is in a hard season in her journey of parenting. And she said to me at some point in the conversation, she said, David... I just want to be Jesus to my children. And I looked at her and I said, respectfully, I don't think you can do that. I think you can be a person who needs Jesus in front of your children. That's what your kids need to see. They need to see you as a mom with palms open who needs Jesus in front of them. And so I want to leave you with that today. I want to pray over you as a church, and then I'm going to invite Pastor Josh to come up. Pray with me now. Father, thank you for the gift that I have been given this weekend to be in this space for this time with these people. I give you so much thanks for this church. That is a light so lovely. That has been my consistent experience. I thank you, Father, for how you are dwelling here how you are living in this space, in these people, and I pray you would continue to equip them, continue to strengthen them, continue to bless them to do that work in this world. Father, thank you that I could be here for this time, and together we could reflect on the very reason you called a child to you and what you had to teach us in doing so. Thank you for that. Father, help us to be more responsive. Help us to be more open. Help us to be more humble. Thank you that you have told us that we can come to you when we've got nothing and you have everything we need. And we give you thanks for that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.